And today on AM Business, we put the spotlight on how Ghana's indigenous manufacturing firms, from the shoemakers to the gin distillers, are creating jobs and also boosting economic growth from firms, making medicines to the enterprises also making shoes. And there are many indigenous of such companies creating jobs to boost Ghana's economy. Well, there's now a growing campaign to boost made in Ghana goods and its consumption, all to encourage growth in the manufacturing sector. And today on AM Business, we put a spotlight on some of these indigenous companies expected to benefit from this very campaign. of Ghana's largest manufacturing companies here, that is Casapreco Ghana Limited, to see what goes into manufacturing, what takes place, the intricacies of the industry, as well as some of the production challenges. We'll be looking at that very soon with the production manager, as well as the CEO of Casapreco Ghana Limited. Casapreco Industries Limited. A member of Ghana's list of prestigious companies has grown from a small alcoholic beverage making firm to conglomerate employing thousands of workers. It's one of the local businesses rubbing shoulders with top international firms operating in the country. Richard A.J. is the managing director at Casa Preco. Casa Preco for 25 years we're only doing um, spirits. Um, but over the last few months, we've started doing soft drinks and water, and which are doing quite well on the market. So on a daily basis, we are able to produce close to 30 to 40,000 bottles um, on a daily basis, even though our capacity is um, much more than that. Um, but we have set up our capacity in order to grow um, on that, but we're able to produce close to 40,000 bottles, both on the alcoholic side and the um, CSD side, including water as well. At Casa Preco, we currently employ close to 400 people. Um, if you add the packaging side to it, um, then we are moving up to about 600 um, people. The success of Casa Preco has been driven by the very large and active consumer markets. If I should say in the past, the the consumers mainly um, went for imported products because there was the belief that anything produced in Ghana or manufactured in Ghana was not of good quality. But I think in the past 10 to 15 years, all the companies that have set up in Ghana, um, for example, our company ourselves, um, if you look at farm milk, if you look at other manufacturing companies, um, I think the products that are coming out from Ghanaian manufacturers um, as of international standard. So I think we have um, improved tremendously over the past 10 to 15 years. Like Casa Preco, Fernat is another indigenous manufacturing firm employing about 100 workers. The company manufactures furniture of all types for various purposes. William Olmsted is the managing director. Fernart was established in 1974. Um, it was three um, men got together, an Italian furniture maker and two um, heads of prominent families. One of them was um, an Omabo, who was a regional chief and chancellor of the university, and, and then another family also. Um, initially, it was wonderful. Fernart was the leading uh, woodworking company, whatever, for several decades. Um, we originally did um, State House when it was converted for Parliament. We've done many of the big embassies around Accra. Um, most of the old wealthy families in Accra have Fernart furniture in their house still. Despite the success stories, these businesses have their own challenges. Ghana has gone through years of load shedding, a situation that significantly affected the output of many businesses. But that's not all. The country's tax regime has meant these businesses pay more to operate. William is not enthused about the state of affairs. 
Most of the, the quality timber that's, lump, that's cut in Ghana is exported um, by a huge margin. Um, and most of those companies are, that are doing that work are set up in free trade zones, which means the government is supporting them to export. It is not supporting them to supply the local market. And so at this point, um, it's a real challenge. Um, if we go to those companies, and they're good companies, um, you know, Logs and Lumber, Najadeva up in Kumasi, um, we then have to pay a 44% um, customs fee on top of their normal, what they charge at their outside customers um, because they're in a free trade zone. So it's, a, it's an area where government policy is really advantaging raw material export and as a result disadvantaging um, sort of indigenous value added industry. We have no furniture to export. I mean, nobody is building anything that's ready to export. Um, and because, uh, because everything for export has to be in, in breakdown state, you have to be able to reassemble it after you shipped it, otherwise your shipping costs are outrageous, um, it would take a significant investment for us to get back into that market. Um, I think we could go into it if we could get the supplies of timber and do maybe garden furniture that collapses easily and things. But otherwise, it's gonna take um, a really sizable investment in re-engineering everything um, so that we figure out how we can maintain our existing quality and yet not have traditional joinery. Companies operating the country's free zone enclaves are expected to enjoy various tax incentives. But for many of these companies, there's a big concern. The tax holidays are simply not there, they say. Some, there are some incentives out there. Um, for example, if you are exporting outside of Ghana, you don't pay so much taxes as you are selling in Ghana. That's one. And there are some other incentives if you are able to set up a factory outside of the main cities, let's say Accra, Kumase, you set up somewhere at Pram Pram. Um, there are some tax benefits, but those also come with issues. Because you get to those areas, there's no water, there's no um, telephone calls and stuff like that. There are some issues that come with that. These challenges notwithstanding, business must go on. These companies are investing heavily in advertising in the hope of seeing more patronage. But others are running on referrals and endorsements. Tony Senaya, the CEO of Horseman Shoes, recently received an endorsement from the first gentleman of the land, President Mahama. That was a big boost, Tony says. Um, the endorsement was great and um, it has affected us in a lot of ways such that it has even gone beyond us as at Horseman Shoes to encourage a lot of local shoe manufacturers because now you see a lot of young people um, starting their shoe brands and even in Kumasi a lot of manufacturers were very encouraged that if the number one gentleman of the land is um, a patron of Made in Ghana Shoes then the opportunities and the potential is very huge um, but personally, I would say that, yes, it gave us a lot of brand mileage, you know. Um, most people didn't even know about, her, about us, but then when the president mentioned it, I'm sure about several millions of people across the world heard of Horseman Shoes. I have asked um, brand experts that if they were managing the president, how much they would have charged for such an endorsement, but nobody has been able to put a figure to it, so it was it was priceless endorsement. So yes, it, it's good to get such endorsements, and even going beyond the endorsement, the usage of the product by themselves. But if these industries would thrive, there's the need for skilled labor. Tony sees investment in skills as critical to the survival of local industries. Um, as a local producer, we are faced with a number of challenges. Um, top of my mind, I would say that. Um, the issue of human resource, getting skilled labor plus good attitude, you know, because we demand a lot of, we use a lot of um, manpower, people who are skilled artisans, you know. So um, these guys are normally people who have had little education, they went into shoemaking not because they had the passion for it, just because they couldn't continue the education. So go and then this vocation. Bringing them into a formal setting sort of is a bit of a challenge because they don't understand. They want to sit by their small tables and do a pair a week and they call themselves masters. So human resources is, is, is one big challenge because like I said before, capacity is very important if we want to scale up and meet the local demand and kick out foreign, um, foreign, foreign shoes. 
but because we don't have the skilled labor, because we don't have um, the capacity to meet those challenges, um, I am afraid that if it is not addressed, we may remain, we may remain where we are, become small players, and do it as <laughs> as a hobby, as a passion. So I would say yes, human resources challenge is a challenge. Then of course I would also mention that um, um, financing, getting funding for SMEs is, is a big challenge here. Ghana has mounted an aggressive campaign to boost the consumption of made in Ghana goods. I was very excited when um, the president made his announcement and I heard, knew there was legislation and I immediately had one of my people get a hold of the regulations that they were promulgating for the program and um, all my hopes for the program just kind of crashed at that point because it, it appeared to me that my first degree was political science and we looked at bureaucracy and this was one of those real examples to me of bureaucracy run wild and they imposed a lot of regulations that had nothing to do with ensuring the products were made in Ghana but at the same time took out so many Ghanaian products. Probably the primary example is under the regulations as they existed um, nine months ago um, you had to have an ISO 9001 certification. Um, I don't know if you've ever been through the process, but it's a very long, involved process. You have to bring in outside auditors several times. You have to have a stack of paperwork like this. We can probably do it eventually, uh, partly because I've got the experience and I've done it, but most Ghanaian businesses of our size are smaller. I just don't have the resources, let alone kind of the understanding. And it has nothing to do with ensuring that things are good here. I mean, it's, it's the kind of certification you would want to have if you were exporting. But it doesn't have anything to do with, with consumption within the business and building value-added industries. So, um, so I was pretty disappointed. I'd love to see it, it go back into um, effect in a reasonable basis. Postman CEO Tony agrees. With the made in Ghana policy, um, I think that it is long overdue because no country will really develop when they are hugely dependent on imports. You know, so um, for starters, I think that um, they should look at growing and boosting the capacity of local industry because I have heard people say that uh, we should totally ban the import of certain products but then I ask myself if these products are banned are the Ghanaian companies ready to to supply the needs of, of, of the local market which I think we are not ready yet so um, I have read the policy and I think that there should be more pragmatic steps to boost the capacity which is very very important of the local um, producers and manufacturers. An increased export from Ghana could mean more foreign exchange for the country. If we are able to produce a lot of stuff here, we will not need to import too many stuff. Um, and this makes uh, our economy more stable. Um, and once we are able to produce a lot of stuff here, we can also send finished goods outside of the country and at least bring in some foreign exchange as well and to let other countries know what Ghana is doing. We don't only have to send um, the raw materials outside or the resources outside, um, for example, like cocoa and stuff like that. If you're able to process it here, um, it will drive our economy better and make it more solid. I think it's incredibly vital for countries to have value-added industries. Um, if you're just an extraction, if, if your raw materials are just being sent someplace else, you're completely at the mercy of, of global markets for commodities. And um, it really kills you. So if we could develop or redevelop the industrial base that Ghana used to have, it makes the entire economy less subject to international fluctuations. It, in addition to all the jobs it provides and all the other advantages we have. Generally, the indigenous manufacturing companies are critical to the growth of Ghana's economy. They command a huge labor force. To ensure they contribute more, however, what these businesses need now is a more friendly environment. Well, so with the right implementation of policies by government and stakeholders, as well as the availability of the key factors of production to the stakeholders and those in the manufacturing sector, Ghana could perhaps achieve its vision of becoming a high middle income economy. Reporting from Fernat in Osu, it's Sheila Tamaklo. And uh, Sheila Tamaklo uh, bringing to us that uh, very story about how we can make sure we boost um, local enterprises but also patronizing their goods. 
alongside what the state and state policy implementation could help in complementing all these efforts. We hope that uh, we've had great lessons learned from that very piece by Sheila Tamaklu and the business team, but that is where we have to uh, part ways as far as we're concerned for this very um, morning's AM business. But uh, so to be part of this uh, Made in Ghana agenda, uh, make it also a point to be part of Joy Prime Made in Ghana Fair at the Nungwa Junction Mall. Uh, the Junction Mall is just uh, close to crowd from this very Friday, uh, November 4th, 2016. But that was it for AM business this morning. Make sure you join the team same time next week, Wednesday, for another edition. But the AM show continues with a lot more programming. Do stay on.